So before we have Wayne uh, from Zongan Insurance come on stage, we'll do a short presentation on what we're seeing in China, especially as it pertains to uh, the two largest sort of fintech giants we're seeing today, obviously Ant Financial being one of them. We had Suhail here earlier uh, today, and then also Tencent and their efforts of what they're doing in fintech. So if we look at sort of just the largest sort of financial institutions in the world today, um, I think what's interesting is, you know, outside of the largest banks globally, we now see Ant Financial with a valuation as of its last financing round of $150 billion. Uh, this is incredible, I think, for as just an event in, in sort of fintech uh, overall. We see this larger than sort of the market caps of banks like Santander, Goldman Sachs. So I think what we want to do is let's just trace how maybe they got there a little bit very briefly. So if we go back 10 years ago, uh, Alipay was really just a, a very fast growing online payment service. It was enabled by three key things. One was it enabled uh, the Taobao marketplace uh, transactions to, to flow more seamlessly. The second was that it really bypassed credit cards. Nobody was really using credit cards, and, and this escrow-based system um, really functioned well in that regard. And the third was that they looked to expand it um, slowly, um, but, grad but gradually uh, beyond Alibaba, so partnering with other uh, places where, the, where you could use Alipay and accept Alipay. Then, of course, you know, a year later, China's mobile internet boom took place. The number of mobile internet users grew by more than 400 million uh, just uh, between 2008 and 2014. Uh, so the incredible pace of this mobile boom really catapulted uh, Alipay into a pretty dominant service. Uh, as of sort of 2014, market share was, was about 80% uh, in, in sort of the, the China mobile payments uh, ecosystem. Of course, there's always competition. We referred to that earlier in the presentation today. And, and one of the largest competitors now, obviously, is WeChat Pay. So WeChat is the largest social app in, in China. And it's really sort of enabled by a couple of key factors of what they've developed over time. One is sort of product innovation. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of localized concepts that have done well for them in that regard, whether that's sort of using this concept of the peer-to-peer -peer red envelope. 768 million senders sent uh, WeChat red envelopes on uh, Chinese New Year this year. And also online to offline partnerships, uh, partnering with some of their investments that they've made in companies like Didi and, and Meituan, which is the largest food delivery service in China. These also enable uh, you know, high, high frequency transactions of the service. Uh, and today, both of these services now control about 92% of the, the mobile payments landscape in, in China. Uh, we don't have the US here, but it's sort of a speckle of what we've seen in terms of mobile payments, uh, in, in terms of the surge of mobile payments over the last few years in China. I can tell you, if you go to China, the, the notion that cash is, is gone is actually very real, um, and it's actually very difficult to transact at, at different areas without it, uh, without your access to one of these accounts. So just to wrap up on that front, I think we always tend to overestimate the change that will occur in two years and underestimate 10, right? So if we look at just 10 years ago, it was an online service. Today, it's the largest sort of mobile payment service uh, in the world. So you know, now, I think the other thing that happened was just this evolution into a broader ecosystem of products within financial services. You started with payments, now operating in wealth management, so the largest money market uh, fund in the world is Yoi Bao, larger than JP Morgan's market money fund, money market fund, excuse me, uh, and, and also expanding into other services like insurance, credit scores, uh, consumer lending as well. Um, so really building an ecosystem approach to financial services. Of course, there's always challenges. Um, two of the big ones are, are regulation and, and maybe seeing if this can go global as well. So regulatory uh, environment in China is also uh, changing very quickly, especially in, in financial services. Um, certainly, they don't want services to grow too big or, or grow too fast or out of proportion. So we've seen that at least not sort of hinder, but have an impact on, on, on um, how some of these companies are, are developing their strategy, whether that's capping sort of limits on, on withdrawals or, um, or sort of you know, not, not necessarily being able to use some of the credit scoring technologies, data that they've used. Uh, in the wild yet and, and trying to sort of be cautious on some of those approaches. So regulatory is a, is a big part of it. Uh, and also global, we heard, we heard earlier from, uh, from Ant Financial, but we've seen a, a, what the, the strategy take place and the playbook take place is actually partnering with local partners uh, in different regions. Southeast Asia is, is probably the most prominent uh, where they're partnering with a lot of local companies in different uh, countries. Perhaps we might see that move to other countries as well. They struck the first partnership in, in Mexico earlier uh, this spring. And this is a quote from uh, Joe Tsai, from the uh, co-founder and executive uh, vice chairman of, of Alibaba, who mentions uh, the, the real sort of uh, strategy here is interoperability, where you can use the service in the Philippines, but also maybe go to another country and, and also use it. That's sort of the vision behind maybe the, how they might expand globally. Um, so when we look ahead over the next 10 years, you know, I think distribution 
plus this access to this massive amount of data equals sort of massive opportunities ahead. Um, over the next 10 years, we expect, and, and, and what's already happening, is sort of the mobile payments war that we've seen is really going to be sort of waged offline. So um, this concept of, of new retail where you're merging sort of offline commerce with, uh, with um, mobile and online payments technology and making it much more seamless to, uh, to transact is something that's becoming a, a very prominent theme uh, today. And we're starting to see uh, a lot more innovation come out of uh, offline payments in, in China, whether that's ordering uh, Starbucks at one of the many locations, whether that's being at a grocery store and paying for something that comes delivered to your home uh, while you're at the store or, or just out uh, shopping, um, or whether it's sort of cashless checkout and, and using new sort of biometrics or facial technology to, to walk into a store, pick something up, and then, and then go out. Um, and there's also sort of industry opportunities which are sort of under um, maybe um, under indexed today so far. So insurance is, is one of them. We're going to hear from Wayne uh, at Tsungan, but uh, certainly we're seeing different strategies, whether that's personalized products offering maybe a tailored product to you know, a massive user base in, in health or uh, critical illness. Uh, we're also seeing back end improvement, we're seeing tech companies try to improve China's sort of legacy uh, insurance companies with, with better technology. And we've also seen innovation, especially on the B2B2C concept, where plugging in insurance products where people are spending time, whether it's in you know, travel websites or, um, or marketplaces or, or social apps. Wealth management is, is another uh, area where we expect to see a lot more innovation, both from these companies as well as you know, many others uh, in China. We, talk, we heard from a lot of the wealth management startups and, and companies here in the States uh, the last few days. But uh, looking at the market opportunity, you know, we've seen China's wealth management uh, industry, at least from investable assets, grow from about $4 billion to $26 billion in 2016. So certainly, if we talk about wealth tech as a category, one of the largest opportunities globally would be, happen to be in China. Um, we've also seen, uh, we've also seen, uh, I skipped this slide, but we've also seen sort of digital wealth management uh, evolve where a lot of the focus so far is obviously on single, mar uh, single products, very simple products like money market funds and others, um, where over time this will evolve into a much more complex uh, portfolio of different uh, assets, whether it's equities and, and other, uh, a lot more evolution in terms of um, sophistication of wealth management products there. And, and digital is, it will be uh, impactful as we see over the next few years. Um, and lastly, I think we'll also see uh, digital transformation, uh, at least hopefully, uh, uh, at least these companies are hoping uh, of China's actually uh, existing financial institutions where we're starting to see a lot of tech companies um, also partner with, with existing banks to help improve and, and sort of um, set them on path towards digital transformation. So certainly a lot happening in China. This is just sort of a taste of, of what we're seeing today. But um, with that, I'm going to have Cam uh, come back and introduce Wayne. Thank you very much.